Hey, hey guys. Okay, um, thanks Rob. So yeah, my name's Sam Franklin. Uh, in this session, I'm going to be covering uh, a use case I've been working on for quite a while um, of the implementation of an Earth observation data platform for the UK government. Um, yeah, just a little bit more on my background. I'm a geospatial developer. I've also got a background in Earth science and I've been wrangling and dealing with environmental data for quite some time. Um, I've been with CGI for about four years. A good chunk of those four years, I've actually been involved in one way or another in this project. So yeah, uh, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, give some background to the project, then really try and sort of nail what the, what the problem Sort of this implementation was was trying to solve. Then, uh, then I'll go through the implementation, which is called the Earth Observation Data Service. I'm going to cover some of the use cases that the users have supplied to me uh, and how they re relate to environmental sustainability. And then, hopefully, I have time to, yeah, kind of, sort of cover some of the lessons learned. Effectively, we've been in production for over a year, so uh, yeah, you learn a lot in in production. Effectively. Um, so I think it's worth covering, you know, who we're actually doing this project for. We're working for the UK Department uh, for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, and um, they're referred. I'll refer to them as DEFRA in this in this talk. Um, DEFRA is a big ministerial department, but it also has a number of different uh, agencies it works with or they report into, and they all have some kind of delegated environmental responsibility, effectively. Um, DEFRA informed us that in one way or another, their department and all these sister agencies, some of them that I'm showing, there's potentially up to 5,000 staff that have some kind of technical component to their role. So they might be using geospatial or EO data. So effectively, this has got a big user base. Uh, DEFRA did a, a, a lot of scoping uh, around this project and the, the sort of seeds of it were back in 2015. So they identified a number of broad sort of use areas where either EO data was kind of being used but maybe not being maximized or not being used at all. I've just highlighted a couple. Um, yeah, they go from like incident, uh, so emergency incident sort of response management um, applications like uh, flooding or wildfire events, uh, from policy kind of areas around sort of climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation, and also some of the more kind of you know research or you know, common EO use cases were to do with crop mapping, bare soil analysis, and um, land use change detection and habitat mapping. So yeah, what what was that, what was going on? Why did this sort of service and, and project kind of come about? Um, yeah, this is really sort of around 2017 is when this sort of scoping kind of occurred. And DEFRA found that in its organization and the sister agencies that use the data, there are a number of different user communities where they were uh, each processing ARDs independently for like specific projects. And different communities were doing different tooling, and there was a lot of duplicated effort. And they actually estimated about 70% of the time on doing some kind of uh, Earth observation analysis was spent in producing an analysis ready product, an ARD, as, uh, as it's referred to. So there's clearly a case to centralize that or, or uh, you know, make that more efficient. The client DEFRA also wanted like a high availability platform with strict SLAs. They wanted, because a number of mission critical services could come about from this, they wanted an independent store of ARD rather than like rely on a third party. And also, yeah, just try and improve access to the data. So a common access point for ARDs and make that access portal, you know, for non-technical so like point and click users as well as provide technical kind of APIs for sort of, you know, data scientists and uh, the like. That, what I've just described as around what's happening kind of in DEFRA, wider, more widely in the UK community, there was a, there was a key report produced, um, there's a link on, on screen, uh, uh, to do with um, effectively making a case for producing an ARD product, a standardised ARD product, certainly for Sentinel-2. And um, a lot of technical detail came out of this report, and some of it I summarised. I won't sort of walk through each each point. Ultimately, they kind of concluded that a user would want a single geotiff rather than like a separate collection of geotiffs, so band stacked, 
and topographically corrected for a UK high resolution DTM, reproject that uh, GeoTIFF uh, ready for use in a GIS system um, or, or other, you know, and that was reprojected to the British National Coordinate System. That's like, like a local plane system and have, you know, appropriate metadata. There's a, there's a number of other key areas, but um, yeah, I'll have to skip that. So in terms of our overall Earth Observation Data Service implementation, there's a collaborative project between, we're well, effectively DEFRA in-house teams that manage kind of the infrastructure. So everything was delivered on Microsoft, the Microsoft Azure platform, and they handled the, the DevOps sort of pipelines, that kind of stuff. We worked with uh, an organization called the JNCC. Uh, that's a UK body that provided uh, like technical expertise uh, on Earth observation imagery. And CGI, the company I work for, um, was the delivery partner. So we delivered an ARD generation sort of pipeline. Um, so that process Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data in this revised ARD format that I described earlier, um, within about 10 hours from satellite acquisition, so out drops a cloud optimized GeoTIFF, and into that Azure storage account um, uh, yeah, uh, area, we were keeping a rolling 18 month archive of ARDs effectively, but as, as the real time data came in and as data dropped off our kind of rolling archive, it was all backed up to uh, like a centralized UK archive called CEDA. So if there's people from the UK, the research scientists, they might be familiar. CEDA um, collects EO climatological data sets and everything's sort of generally available under an open and permissive license. So all the data that gets produced from this system is available publicly. We stood up a number of different uh, interfaces into that data. I'll cover that in a second. But yeah, these government projects, there's a number of different stage gates and it all takes time, frankly. So we delivered an early proof of concept, like an alpha project in 2018. Uh, and but the final production go live was 2020, uh, uh, mid 2020, so about a year ago. OK, so um, this is Foster G. So I guess yeah, I, I need to talk about like tooling because a lot of people like that. Um, yeah, there's quite a it's quite a busy slide, so I'll 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 deal with the stuff on the left first. Effectively, that's our ARD processing pipeline. Um, so we grab uh, level one C data from one of the ESA DIAS partners. Uh, this project uses Atos Mundi, and um, yeah, that data comes down into two pipelines: one for Sentinel one, one for Sentinel two. These are all on it's on Azure. These are all Azure virtual machines. Like well spec virtual machines. And in this processing pipeline, there's a set of common tools. Everything's Python based. And um, so we use a package called Celery, which is a Python package for like queuing jobs. So effectively, you download a list of jobs of the latest images for our area of interest, and Celery queues up those jobs. Once a job is you know in progress, we use another package called Luigi. That's a Python package. That's for like batch processing. So we're going to have a number of different processing steps. You know, check the checksum of the data. Is that valid? You know, run the atmospheric correction on that data. That's another work Luigi workflow task. Then GDAL pro, you know, do the reprojection step. Um, so yeah, there's a number of different processing steps. Some of them are specific to Sentinel One and Sentinel Two. Like we use a, a Dockerized Snap ESA Snap uh, Sentinel One toolbox on Sentinel Two processing. We use a, uh, a tool called ArcC that came out of that report that I referred to. ArcC is quite quite good because it can use this framework called MPI that that allows effectively a, you know, a manager worker manager machine to then uh, uh, parallel process a number of different central tool granules in your SWAF, making use of a cluster of Linux computers. And uh, but ultimately, out of this pipeline you get this revised or this alternative ARD format, cloud optimized GeoTIFF, that gets pushed to an Azure storage blob store account. Then we've got the, the solution stack effectively, which then allow the users to get into that. So um, yeah, here we're using open source stack based on well, the Geonode stack. If you're not familiar with Geonode, that's like a, 
an open source tool, which is basically a content management system for geospatial data, almost like a WordPress, you know, uh, that might be doing Geonode a bit of a disservice, but um, yeah, that's a, like a, that's a kind of popular stack for federating, making a web portal effectively. So then users get into that via that web portal or via like a REST API, a Geo server, the mapping publishing server produces a number of different OGC or makes available OGC protocols like WMS uh, and WPS. They're like for mapping and processing. If they're too, you know, if they're, you know, some of them can be quite tricky to use. We, we cater for a range of different like um, user profiles. So we also stood up a, or provided a, a Python client, um, which, you know, you can use from a Jupyter notebook, search and discover against this portal and fetch data, pull it down effectively. So, um, yeah, we're talking, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Geonode portals, it's the search and discovery portal. Uh, Geonode's an open source package and, you know, we've done some customizations for this project. Um, I'm going to try and use the pointer, see if this works. Hopefully that's working. So yeah, we've added some project specific um, uh, filters like on satellite platform, cloud cover that you can like, you know, uh, deselect cloudy scenes. Geno, well, we added uh, like a, a useful sort of user generated um, uh, geometric sort of search area. So you can filter in data. That wasn't in Geonodes, so we added that. Yeah, the next kind of customization, yeah, this is kind of an interesting one. If you're familiar with Sentinel-2 imagery, may or may not have come across this. This certainly wasn't in the design. This is like an issue that kind of came up during implementation, which, you know, frequently happens. So ESA, well, on Sentinel-2 imagery, um, ESA like prepare these granules, which are like fixed spatial areas, like it defined in by one of these red boxes. Generally, that's full of satellite image, but for infrequent, on infrequent periods, ESA split the granule uh, for like reprocessing reasons. Um, this kind of caused a problem when users were using a different feature of the site to generate a cloud optimized, uh, sorry, uh, a, a cloud free mosaic. Um, let's say that granule was like the best uh, cloud free for that specific area that would get selected by this algorithm. Ultimately, users were getting holes in their cloud-free mosaic. So we modified the API to kind of tag this as a split granule and go off and find the counterpart granule to kind of just ease that kind of workflow effectively. A third thing we did, um, yeah, a, a request came from for users that they wanted a static web map service layer for their corporate GIS. You know, this is within DEFRA. And uh, they wanted the layer to change, so they didn't do any additional administration. But they wanted to then, you know, under the hood, update the component layers that you know were used in that composite layer. So we exposed the Geo Server Group Layer feature that allows you to, you know, do exactly that, like a composite or mosaic of different layers. Expose the REST endpoint to allow, you know, the manager or the owner of that layer to, you know under the hood, send a post request into the API to change the underlying data. So those kind of like tweaks and sort of exposing features that weren't you know, out of the box in Geonode was sort of the, the task we had to do. I'm just going to cover some of the, uh, yeah, the use cases uh, from, from some of the users that they've supplied to me. I'm on the implementation side, so I've worked with the users uh, who are using the actual data. This one comes from um, the environment agency in the UK. Um, here they're using Sentinel-2 imagery, winter imagery only, combined with uh, with LiDAR. Uh, they gener generated a risk space model to effectively highlight areas of bare earth or bare soil. Um, and then they combine that with a DTM to kind of find, you know, whereabouts in these fields, whether with the high risk areas of soil erosion, soil erosions are, or 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 runoff effectively has multiple issues. Uh, it can contribute to flooding uh, if there's like an adjacent water course, which is what they're showing on this uh, image here. Um, the water quality issues uh, from you know just increased sediment load and you know phosphates in the rivers sort of um, running off the field. And yeah, with that risk-based model, they could then actually 
you know, work with a ground team in their organization and go out and proactively contact the landowner of that high risk area, work with them on like mitigation and you know, just raise awareness about this you know, environmental issue effectively. So it's quite a good sort of case of using you know, EO data to then proactively work with people on the ground that are ultimately going to, you know, might have an impact on the environment. Yeah, the second one, these are all kind of agricultural use case, because effectively the, the DEFRA, the, uh, the department we're working for, uh, you know, is remit is agriculture. So the second one is to do with plastic sheeting on fields, which is apparently widely used in agriculture. I think I'm not an expert. Uh, I'm not a farmer, so if there's any farmers on the on this, they can help me out. Um, I think you use plastic sheeting for like weed control, and also there are a number of other benefits of like nutrient uptake. Apparently, anyway. So the Environment Agency wanted to highlight plastic sheeting areas from you know from a satellite image. The issues around here are again surface water flooding. Flooding is like a huge issue in the UK as it is elsewhere. And also, uh, the agency were involved, you know, uh, wanted to like understand sort of contribution of microplastics into the environment. Um, so, yeah, what they've done here is uh, do segmentation on the field boundaries. And then I think, as I understand, there's a false color applied to this with, you know, certain channels highlighted and ultimately the red areas, the red pinky areas, if you can see my uh, pointer. Um, they're the most likely plastic uh, fields covered with plastic cheating. Yeah, okay, yeah, then they've uh, labelled up those fields. Again, they can then contact the landowner and work with them on awareness and mitigation sort of strategies. Yeah, the final, yeah, a third, a third one I want to show is, again, on the agricultural side, they, uh, the Environment Agency wanted to, yeah, undertake an analysis nationwide on sort of the extent and prevalence of pig farming areas. So this is uh, the impacts here are uh, related to uh, water quality, again, runoff. This is, you know, uh, uh, I think uh, E. coli and uh, bacterial uh, impacts into the rivers and local air quality. So apparently Sentinel-2 imagery um, the shape of the farms and these telltale dots in the field, uh, you can, they managed to uh, do some logic modeling and train a machine learning algorithm to pretty accurately identify these areas and then look at the change, you know, over time of, you know, the extent of these farms, are they, you know, increasing in size. Here, they've also provided some LIDAR. So if you overlay that LIDAR, you can pick out these, I think these are called huts, apparently. That's where the pigs are reared outdoors and they live are reared. Anyway, so yeah, that's a that's another kind of agricultural kind of use case. Uh, okay, so I just wanted to kind of finish up on yeah, really, um, we've been in production over a year. Uh, we've learned a lot. Um, a couple of things I, I wanted to kind of um, yeah draw sort of attention to so yeah around sort of cloud optimized geotiffs uh which seem to be sort of you know increasingly prevalent you know in use so we're, we're using cloud optimized geotiffs originally the ard spec actually wasn't for a cloud optimized geotiff it was a geotiff we de we made use of cloud optimized geotiffs really as a way to kind of improve the performance of our mapping server to get rendering these images are quite big sitting in object storage you know five gig Sentinel-1 radar image. And um, to get performance for GeoServer to render the, the, you know, from the mapping server, we use cloud-optimized GeoTIFFs. And, um, but then I think we maybe didn't quite realize the sort of capability of them in that they sit in the cloud and then users work remotely and can read write directly off them. So as part of the design, and again, this is a long lead time project, we don't expose the cloud-optimized GeoTIFF to the end user. We, as part of the sort of service design, we stood up, you know, standard OGC services. So a WPS, which is a web processing service. So, you know, users can extract data, download data, but if they want to do it programmatically, they still need to go in via the WPS interface. And as time went on, yeah, we're sort of seeing that the WPS interface is kind of, I don't know, uh, for some entry level uh, people, it's, it's quite 
hard to like wrangle. Um, so we developed like a, a Python like wrapper library that you can just use. That kind of eases the WPS sort of experience. But it's yeah, with hindsight, I think exposing the cloud optimized GTF directly to the user would have definitely been the way to go. Yeah, and the second one, uh, sort of semi-related. I've, I've sat on two workshops already in Phosphor G this week and had some awesome, you know, presentations on the stack sort of spec, which is uh, just allows kind of like really powerful searching and cross-referencing between EO ARD catalogs, exactly what we've got. And so we stood up a catalog for web service, which was at the time really the sort of standard XML-based metadata standard. And um, yeah, again, we're sort of seeing that it's kind of hard to pass. And um, yeah, I think effectively we've got a whole stack of ARDs sitting in object storage, which are publicly available on the Cedar archive. And there's no stack metadata at present. And I'm actively now thinking on looking at a way to stand up a, a stack API, but I need to work out how much effort it is and you know costs and then and wrap that all up um so yeah i think uh yeah the final one is just i've, I've added some links obviously i think these slides are going to get shared of where to access the data and some of the uh repos that um we've been we've used and um yeah i think i think that's um yeah that's it from me awesome Thanks, Sam. And, uh, thanks for, for sharing those lessons learned. I think that's really important that, um, you know, as we're building out this infrastructure, we're not going to get it completely right all of the times at, at first try. So uh, the more yeah. we can share. And stuff lessons. changes under your feet and like yeah. a, in a long project, it's, oh, as, yeah, Microsoft will deliver a new f feature. And it's like, ah, oh, we've done that already. And that's, that's great. Uh, but yeah. Totally. Totally. Um, so yeah, there's a few questions rolling in. Um, okay. uh, what is, uh, are any of the output data, uh, open data, for example, the field boundaries? No, that's, uh, so as my, to my knowledge, no, but I could, Hey, you know what? I actually don't know the answer. So we were responsible for delivering the ARDs, which are all publicly available on one of those links. Um, yeah, the field boundaries, I don't know what they use as a source for that, yeah, that was a use case by the environment agency. So I'm, yeah, I'm in the kind of implementation team. Then a whole bunch of users use the platform. I know the person to ask. I could, um, yeah, his name's on there actually, Crispin Hambridge from the environment agency. Oh, sorry, I'm not showing my screen. So, um, yeah, I could always uh, drop me a message, and I could always put you in contact with with the scientist um, at the environment agency. I assume part of their workflow. They, yeah, they. Yeah, uh, yeah, they they obviously did that as part of the processing. Awesome. Um, what would you recommend for UK public sector geodata organizations currently struggling with a Databricks purview Azure ML architecture and staking, taking steps towards the model you have here? So the question, are you, you're struggling with that. Is that what, no, or are you trying to use that platform? Was that the question? Uh, it's for for uh, folks that are kind of using maybe a Databricks Azure ML uh, architecture um, and integrating some of the work uh, that you've done here. Do you have any recommendations for that? Yeah, I mean, well, get yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, all the uh, it relates to that stack kind of uh, implementation. If you want to kind of search through the data, yeah, you're going to have to have some kind of on the Cedar archive that I mentioned, there is a public API, but it's it's not a stack specification effectively. Um, I mean, it sounds like that architecture, that's pretty good. I mean, I think uh, DEFRA are uh, actively using Databricks. I, I'm not actually a Databricks user. I, I've, I've seen a couple of depots, it's pretty powerful. Um, but um, yeah, I think there's a whole kind of serverless kind of architecture that we haven't used here actually, um, because that sort of predated our design and implementation kind of predated uh, some of those serverless kind of tools that were made available on Azure. So if you're starting your project now, you're almost in a you're in a great place because there's there's there are tons of options open like the Azure 
Kubernetes service and things to do data processing. Um, but yeah, that was mainly really my my job is like work on the data processing side. Awesome. Uh, was this a one-off or did it have a meaningful impact on DEFRA's underlying data and compute infrastructure? Yeah, I think a lot of there were, yeah, effectively, DEFRA had already like subscriptions and they were quite like baked into sort of Azure. So yeah, where, where this kind of helped is just kind of realizing the value of object storage because, you know, you're moving around terabytes of data um, you know, some of the essential one scenes are like five gig each. I think the architecture side, the in-house architecture team really sort of understood the value of object storage and just making that available, you know, from some other service. I think in the past, they'd be shipping data around from one data lake to another. Once it's in object storage, it's it's like that's like a super powerful like cloud technology, I think. And um, yeah. Oh. Yeah, last thing I'll mention, um, you know, thinking through standing up a stack for open data sets that uh, exist on Azure Blob Storage. That's a lot of what my team is is doing is, uh, you know, right. integrating stack stack items. I should, and, I should ask you how to do it. <laughs> or or just make it part of, um, if they're openly licensed data sets, then we'd love to have them part of our catalog. So uh, potentially we can kind of right. offload some of that work for you and, and actually provide those yeah, services. Yeah, because the items on... The items aren't created, right? The JSON items aren't created. So we'd still need to do that on our side. But then mm -hmm. can a separate API kind of sweep that in and then, you know, bingo, it's federated that way. Yeah, check out uh, the Stack Tools packages, GitHub org. Um, yeah, okay. That's what we're using to open source a lot of the um, stack item creation logic. Um, and then right. that's what we use with our processes to uh, ingest that data into our databases and build collections off of that and offer it through the API. So maybe we could talk about that offline, but yeah, I just wanted yeah, to, okay. um, <laughs> to mention good. that uh, a potential potential avenue for collaboration. Um, awesome. Okay. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much, Sam. And, uh, Thanks, and yeah, have a great rest of the conference. Thanks.